The Lord Jesus in the prophetic word, that is the topic we have before us tonight. And first of all, I would like to read from 2 Peter chapter 1, as of verse 16. 2 Peter 1, verse 16. For we have not made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, following clever imagined fables, but having been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, such a voice being uttered to him by the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I have found my delight. And this voice we heard uttered from heaven being with him on the holy mountain and we have the prophetic word made sure to which ye do well take heed as to a lamp shining in an obscure place until the day dawn and the morning star arise in your hearts the lord jesus in the prophetic word. Now the first question that arises is what is the prophetic word? We have found this expression here in verse 19, the prophetic word. Now we need words in order to manifest ourselves. We use words in order to express what we think and what we are. Now God has revealed himself not only by his word but particularly by using words. For sure we can see the greatness of God in creation. The creation speaks of God without using words but in general the God has used words in order to make himself known, to reveal himself. We have that wonderful word of God where we learn who God is. And of course, God has spoken in the Lord Jesus, who is the word, the manifestation of God. Now, the prophetic word, what is the prophetic word? That has to do with the revelation of prophetic things. The prophetic word reveals something. Now, if we consider prophecy or prophetic word, we can distinguish and we have to distinguish three things. First of all, this wonderful book, the Bible, the Word of God, has been written by prophets, Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets. In this sense, the whole Bible is a prophetic word. God has used holy men, prophets, under inspiration in order to write his word this ministry is finished we don't have any more prophets who reveal new things coming from god but and that is the second meaning of prophecy we need those who apply the word of god to our hearts and to our consciences and this is also done by prophetic Ministry. This is what we get in 1 Corinthians 14. Maybe we can just read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. But he that prophesies speaks to man in edification and encouragement and consolation. This is what we still have. God has used prophets in the Old Testament to speak in edification, encouragement, and consolation. He has challenged his people by the prophets. He has encouraged and comforted his people by the prophets. And this is what God is still doing in the prophetic ministry. 
This is also a prophetic word. But then we have prophetic words in a closer sense. And that is what we get in 2 Peter 2. That is what we generally think when we hear about prophets. Prophets tell about the future. And this is the sense in 2 Peter 1. The prophetic word in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in this sense, are all these statements in the Bible that tell us about the future. Old Testament and New Testament. That is the things that are to come. The things that are in front of us that will take place shortly after the rapture. That is the prophetic word. Now, second question, what is the prophetic word about? Normally, when we think about the prophetic word in this narrow sense, we think about future events. We think about what will happen. And of course, the prophetic word is about future events. But the main point in the prophetic words are not the events, but the main point in the prophetic word <clears throat> is a person. That is our Lord Jesus himself. Let us turn to Revelation chapter 19. And I would just like to read the last part of verse 10, Revelation 19, verse 10. There it says, for the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, not of future events, but of Jesus. The main point in the prophetic word is Jesus, our Lord. The prophetic word makes Christ great. That is the main reason why we read the prophetic word. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Now, in this text that we have read, Peter refers to what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that Mount of Transfiguration, of course, speaks of the kingdom, the coming kingdom in might, in power and glory. It's, it is like the kingdom in a nutshell. But what is it about? Again, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the main thing is not a thing, but the main thing is a person. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. For we have not made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, such a voice being uttered to him by the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I have found my delight. Dear friends, if we consider the prophetic word, the prophetic word speaks of Christ. It makes us Christ great. It speaks of the power of Christ. It speaks of the coming of Christ. It speaks of honor and it speaks of glory and it speaks of excellency. That is the main point. Now we know that in three gospels, this happening on the Mount of Transfiguration is mentioned. Matthew, Mark and Luke speak about that. And the fourth time here it is confirmed by Peter. Now if we have a look at into the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, we read, verse 1, that the Lord Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, there are some of those standing here that shall not taste death until they shall have seen the kingdom of God coming in power. Now that is the first point Peter mentions. Verse 16, we have, have not made known to you the power of our Lord Jesus. That refers to Mark. Secondly, he speaks, Peter speaks, of the coming of our Lord Jesus. And turning to Matthew chapter 
16, this is just what Matthew tells us. 16, Matthew 16, verse 28. Verily, I say unto you, there are some of those standing here that shall not taste of death at all until they have, they shall have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You see, Matthew speaks of the coming. And then we have thirdly, honor and glory. And if we turn to Luke chapter 9, we will get that back. In Luke chapter 9, we read at least twice of glory in verse 31, who Moses and Elias, Moses, uh, who appearing in glory, spoke of his departure. And then in the, at the end of 32, but having fully awoke up, they saw his glory. Power, coming, and glory. It's all about the Lord Jesus. And then this great statement, this is my beloved son in whom I have found my delight. Oh, we love to read that. When the Lord Jesus was baptized, he humbled himself as man, was baptized before he started his official ministry, there was also this voice coming from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have found my delight. And here on the Mount of Transfiguration, where they saw the glory, the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus, we hear that voice once again. This is my beloved son. There is only one who is the beloved son this he is the beloved son god does not say he was my beloved son no he is he is the eternal son and he is always the center of the delight of the father he is my beloved son god's own son there is just one my own my son my beloved son and there is a, a relationship of love between the father and the son. There is eternal love. The father loves the son and the son loves the father. This relationship between father and son is characterized by love. In whom I have found my delight. Oh, there is one in whom the father always found, finds, and will find his Delight. That wonderful person, the Lord Jesus. We love to consider him. We love to contemplate him, to focus on him. And here in the prophetic word, we see the Lord Jesus in his power, in his coming, and in his glory. Now, third point what does it mean that the prophetic word is made surer or is established? and confirm now we have to realize that the recipients of this second epistle of peter were born jews were those who knew the old testament very well they knew all about the prophecies of the old testament and in his first letter peter tells us that the prophets in the old testament have been speaking about the sufferings of christ and the glories thereafter. Now everything that was prophesied concerning the sufferings of Christ had been fulfilled. When the Lord Jesus came on earth, he fulfilled everything that was foretold in the Old Testament by the prophets, his sufferings. But what about the glories? That was an important question for those Jews. Christ had come, and in the Old Testament it was told, he will establish the kingdom in power, in glory. He will come visibly in order to deliver his people from all the, 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 the nations around. 
That had not happened. But what about all the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning that wonderful king? Now Peter tells these believers, have a look. On that Mount of Transfiguration, we had a foretaste of that kingdom. And the prophetic word, all that has been foretold concerning that kingdom, that is true. That is established. That is sure. It is sure because God told so in the Old Testament, but it's even more sure, sure because we have seen it in a nutshell on that Mount of Transfiguration. The prophetic word, dear friends, is indeed sure. It is certain all that is told, foretold in the Old Testament will happen. All the promises about the kingdom, they will be fulfilled in a future day. They will be fulfilled soon. That is also something that touches our heart. Yes, the prophets have told about the sufferings of Christ. And we love to remember a Christ who has suffered on Calvary's cross, who suffered there for us, who died there for us. But, and we do also consider him now sitting at the right hand of God. But also all these prophecies of the Old Testament and also in the gospels where the Lord Jesus himself told about that kingdom, all these promises, all these prophecies concerning the kingdom, they will be fulfilled. And they will be fulfilled soon when the Lord Jesus comes back. Now we have seen what the prophetic word means. We have seen what the prophetic word is about. We have been considering the point, what does it mean that the prophetic word is sure? Eh? Now let us have a brief look at to what will happen. Because the revelation of Christ, the peering of Christ in power and glory will be accompanied by many events. And let us very briefly consider these events. Of course, it is impossible in 20 or 25 minutes to consider all the details, but I would just try to, to give an overview in, in five steps of what will happen. The fulfillment of the prophetic word will start with the rapture. That is the first step. The prophetic word is not directly linked to the, to the, to the rapture. The rapture has to do with heaven and not with earth, but it's the starting point, the rapture, the first point. The second is the great tribulation, that hour of trial. The, first, the third point is the appearing of the Lord Jesus in might and in glory and power. The fourth point is the wonderful and glorious kingdom, the millennium as we call it. This wonderful government of Christ of thousand years over heavens and earth. And the fifth point we might consider is the new heaven and the new earth. And in considering these five points very briefly, again, Christ will be the one who stands before us in his greatness and his glories and excellency. Now, the first point is the rapture. We are looking for the rapture. We are looking for the fulfillment of the promise of the Lord Jesus. I will come again for us. That will be glory. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. But then, whom do we see? Who will come? We cannot consider the rapture without considering Christ. He is the one who comes. If we turn to John 14, where the Lord Jesus promised to come back to take us home where he is, into the house of his father, that is the everlasting son who speaks, I will come. We will see the son of God when he comes. Or when we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, when we can just read that verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the last verse. 
Verse 10, we await his son from the heavens, whom he raised from among the dead. Jesus, our deliverer from the coming wrath. The one who comes is his son, the son of God. It is the one whom he raised from among the death, the great victor, the one who lives. It is Jesus, our savior, the one who died for us on the cross. And it is our deliverer from the coming wrath. And if we turn to First Thessalonians chapter 4, where the doctrine of, of, of the rapture is explained, the last verse says we will always, it's not the last verse, verse 17 at the end, we shall be always with the Lord. It is the Lord who will come, the one whom we serve, the one whom we obey, the one whom we follow. And let me quote another verse in the letter epistle to Titus, chapter 2. We read in verse 13 of the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our God, great God and Savior Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, unique title of the Lord Jesus. The one who will come is the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And then Paul adds, who gave himself for us. We will never forget what was necessary, his death on the cross, the rapture. Dear friends, are we waiting for the rapture or are we waiting for the Lord Jesus? Well, we are waiting for both. We are waiting for the rapture, of course. We will be taken out of all the misery around us, all the problems, all the challenges we have every day. Everything will come to an end. But that's not the main point. The main point is not that we are waiting for the rapture. The main point is that we are waiting for our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Deliverer, the great God. This is the one whom we are waiting for. Then after the rapture, there will be a terrible time here on earth. We call that, the Bible calls that, the great tribulation. This expression is found in the Old Testament, and you also get it in the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus himself speaks about that great tribulation. Another expression that we get in Revelation 3 is the hour, the hour of trail. The great tribulation is mostly in reference to the Jews and to Israel and the our of trail has to do with the whole earth. That will be a time of seven years. You might have read in the prophet of Daniel or know about that these 70 weeks Daniel speaks about. And the last week, seven years, is divided in two parts of three and a half year each. And that will be a terrible time of trouble and distress let's just read one one scripture in matthew words of our lord jesus himself matthew 24 the lord jesus speaks about that time in verse 21 for then shall there be a great tribulation do you get the expression such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall be. It will be a terrible time. And if those days had not been cut short, no flesh had been saved. On account of the elect, those days will be cut short. It will be a horrible, an awful time here on earth. What we experience right now these days is like nothing compared to what will happen then. This time, these seven, at least seven years are necessary in order to prepare the coming kingdom. 
Palestine and Europe will be in trouble and distress as never before. In particular, Jerusalem, which means foundation of peace, will be a cup of bewilderment, as we read in the prophet of Zechariah. That city that once crucified Christ will suffer like never a city has suffered before. And if I, when I say city, of course, we mean the inhabitants of that city, the great tribulation. The second step that will take place, and the prophetic word speaks about this period in many, many passages in the Old and in the New Testament. The third step then is the appearing in might and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the rapture when he comes to take us up, but his appearing, his official public appearing here on earth. He will come. He will visibly come on earth in order to establish the kingdom. He will save his people, the Jewish remnant, from all their distress and trouble. And he will judge all the enemies, all the nations that are against Christ. And dear friends, then we will join him. First, he comes for us, rapture, and then he comes with us. We will share his glory. We will be with him when he comes back on earth. And I would just like to read one verse as a reference in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 10, we read about the administration of the fullness of times, that is the millennium, to head up all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth in him in whom we have also obtained an inheritance when christ comes again in judgment that is for preparation of that wonderful kingdom and that is the fourth step the glory of that kingdom that will last at least no that will last thousand years why thousand years? How do we know? We know it from Revelation chapter 20, where these thousand years are mentioned several times. So that is the millennium. Christ will rule as king in righteousness and in peace for thousand years. And many, many scriptures in the Old Testament, particularly in the prophets, speak about that wonderful time about that wonderful king the king of peace the king of righteousness there will be peace there will be righteousness there will be joy here on earth there will be no longer a cross for him but there will be a throne there will be no longer rejection for christ but there will be acceptance there is no longer humbleness of christ but there is his greatness and glory there is no more poverty of christ but there will be glory of christ visibly seen that will be a wonderful time thousand years israel will be united a united nation once again under the reign of Christ. The nations will enter into the blessing of that kingdom also. There will be a temple, another temple in Jerusalem. God will be worshipped in Jerusalem, a center of worship again here on earth in the temple in Jerusalem. It will be a wonderful time, the fullness of time. And all in the prophetic word focuses on that point. That is the final point, the millennium. And Christ's glory in these thousand years. Then we have the end of this thousand years. The kingdom, the millennium will come to an end. And the fifth step, that is the new heaven 
and the new earth. And Peter speaks about that in his second letter, chapter 3. I just read verse 13. But according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. In the millennium, righteousness will reign. But when new heavens and a new earth is established, righteousness will dwell. And let us also quote 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that also speaks about the end of that millennium and the coming eternal state. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24. Then the end... When he gives up the kingdom, that is the millennium, to him who is God and Father. When he shall have annulled all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that is annulled is death. And then verse 28. But when all things have been brought into subjection to him, that is again the millennium, then the son also himself shall be placed in subjection to him, who put all things into subjection to him, that God might be all, might be all, may be all in all. That is the eternal state, God, the triune God, all in all. Very briefly, an overview of what will happen. I repeat, first the rapture, then the great tribulation, then Christ appearing in glory on earth, then this wonderful period that we call the millennium, his reign, thousand years in righteousness and peace, and then after all, new heavens and new earth. The prophetic word. Now oh, there is a last question that remains. Why do we read the prophetic word? Why are we interested in the prophetic words? There are lots of books around that speak about the future. Good books and other books. But we find a lot of prophecy also in the Bible. Why do we read the prophetic word? Why do we want to know what happens, what will happen? Why? Is it just a matter of curiosity? Of course, it is a matter of curiosity. We want to know what will happen. That is something that is of interest, of course. But is that the main point? No, that is not the main point. Curiosity is not the main point to study the word of prophecy. Not at all. We read the prophetic word for different reasons. The first reason, and I come back to what I said in the beginning, the main reason to read the prophetic word is to know more about Christ. We like to focus on him as the humble man who accomplished the work of redemption on Calvary's cross. And rightly we do so. We also like to consider him in his glory now at the right hand of the Father. But the prophetic word makes us Christ great as the King, as the one who, as Son of Man, will rule over all that God has created. Psalm 8. The prophetic word speaks of Christ. It makes us Christ great. And that is the main reason to study the prophetic word. And I would like to encourage us, all of us, to study the prophetic word. But to study it, focusing on the glories of the Lord Jesus. But secondly, there is another reason. And Peter speaks of that. And we have read in verse 19. 
the prophetic word to which ye do well take heed as to a land shining in an obscure place. This obscure place, the place of darkness, is the present age. That is the time in which we live. And dear friends, when it is dark, we need light. The world is in darkness. The period in which we live is a very dark period, an obscure place. We need light. And we have the light. The word of God in general, but particularly the prophetic word throws light on our behavior in this world. We need to know how to behave properly. We have to see how the so-called mainstream works, the spirit of this age. I think you also use that German word, the Zeitgeist. How can we know what is around? All the trends, the mainstream. We know it when we read the word of God, particularly the prophetic word. That is the second reason to study the prophetic word. There is a third reason. In 2 Corinthians 5, we read about the terror of the Lord. That is a strange expression, isn't it? The terror of the Lord. We love to think of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and rightly we do. But there is also a coming wrath, terror of the Lord. We know about that. We know that these terrible judgments will come. And no one, no one will be able to escape the terror of the Lord. That is a very serious thing. And the prophetic word speaks about the terror of the Lord. And that is one motivation to go out and spread the gospel. Of course, there is also the love of Christ that urges us to preach the gospel. But it is also the terror of the Lord. And the prophetic word speaks about that. So studying the prophetic word will make us better witnesses of Christ as long as he is still the savior, as long as the door of salvation is still open. And there is another reason, the fourth reason to study the prophetic word. That is to better await Christ. We keep waiting. Blessed is the servant who is waiting for his master. And to get it right, it's not a matter of knowledge. Or not only a matter of knowledge. It is more a matter of our hearts and of waiting. Of course, we first of all have to know what will happen. We have to know that Christ will come to take us up. We know the truth of the rapture, for example, and also of the appearing, but it's not just a matter of knowledge. It's much more than that. It's a matter of waiting. We are awaiting our Lord from heaven. And the study of the prophetic word helps us to wait more for him. Yes, we wait for the rapture. Or better, we wait for the one who will come to take us up, our Lord Jesus. We should be servants who wait for their master, who are awaiting their master day by day. He can come tomorrow, uh, sorry, today. But are we also awaiting his appearing, the millennium? Maybe we say, well, that's not our problem. Our Christian hope, the typical, the typical Christian hope, is that Christ will come as the bridegroom to take his bride where he is. And that's true. But what does Peter say in 2 uh, Timothy, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse, verse 8? Henceforth, the crown of righteousness is laid up for me. <coughs> which the Lord, the righteous judge, will render to me in that day, 
but not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. Not his rapture, also his rapture, but here Paul says, who love his appearing. We love his coming for us, rapture. That is what we love, but we also love his appearing. Dear friends, why that? Because then the Lord Jesus will be glorified here on earth where he was, where once he was rejected. And we will share his glory. We will appear with him. So studying the prophetic word helps us to more wait for him and to love his appearing. And Peter, he speaks of all these two points, the rapture and his appearing in other words but he says in verse 19 taking heed to which he do well taking heed as to a lamp shining in an obscure place until the day dawn and the morning star arise in your hearts the day dawn that day that is the millennium and we have it already in our hearts waiting for that and the morning star arrive. Uh, we, well, we do well know the morning star, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, the one who will come for the rapture. The day dawn and the morning star arise in our hearts. In our hearts. The heart that speaks of the inner man, but that also speaks of our affections. We love. That day when he comes to take us up to be with him in the glory. But we also love the moment where he will appear in glory here on earth. earth. The prophetic word, dear friends. A wonderful part of the word of God. And I hope that we have seen tonight how important it is to study that prophetic word. Not just to satisfy, satisfy our curiosity, but that Christ may be great for us. The one who loved us and who gave himself for us.